All right, welcome. 2014 December Metrics meeting. Happy holidays. It's good to have you all here. We have a lot of new hires, so I would like to welcome Jacob and Juliet and Jennifer and James and Grace and Stas and Nirzar and Pratik. So please make a point of finding them. We also have new contractors, interns, and volunteers. So we'd also like to welcome Sandra, Jerry, Megan, Maria, Samuel, Sabrina, Valerie, Wes, Naharika, Tracy, Amanda, and Samir. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Moving on, we have a bunch of anniversaries. I particularly want to call out Megan for five years. <laughs> And it's good to celebrate the time that Felix has had with us. I also have one more little tiny thing to sneak in. Um, our general counsel, Jeff Brigham, just got an, um, awarded most innovative general counsel by the Financial Times. So he's not here in person to embarrass him, but I think that's a fabulous thing. And that's after our own Garfield Bird got um, Bay Area C above the year. So we're doing pretty well in some of those categories. All right, moving on. We're doing a new thing where we're announcing some of the milestones that we've achieved on a monthly basis. I'm going to turn this one over to Eric. Good morning. So the things that we want to highlight on the engineering side is we just completed, literally uh, a couple days ago, the rollout of the HHPM for all users on Wikipedia, which means that saving pages should be... <laughs> <laughs> this kind of weird. <laughs> saving pages should be a lot faster now. Um, and you should notice it even if you haven't turned on HHVM yet because it's now turned on for everyone. Um, we also rolled out a completely new search engine for all Wikimedia wikis um, that should make it a lot easier for our developers on mobile and desktop um, to actually build search into various types of applications, use it in new ways, and we also have lots of new user-facing capabilities. Um, we had committed to a whole bunch of changes for Media Viewer, um, including uh, making the captions visible whenever you look at an image, making it easier to zoom, making it easier to turn off uh, if you don't like it, all of which has gone out. Uh, once we pushed out the zoom feature, the folks on the reader side, uh, the anonymous users, um, actually turned it off a lot less, like we saw a massive decrease in uh, the opt-out rate for readers, and we have done much more uh, usability research on it and also validated that um, there are no usability issues with the current product at this point in time. Um, so people know how to use it, they understand what it does, how to turn it off if they don't like it. Um, so we've got that done. Uh, in November we also pushed out table editing for Visual Editor, which was one of the last uh, reasons you might have to use uh, Wikitext when editing a Wikipedia article. Um, when looking at a complex page with a complex table where you want to add or modify rows or columns, you can all do that and Visual Editor now. And as you know, we moved our bug tracking system over to a new tool called Fabricator, which was a huge migration with 73,000 tickets, uh, which went painlessly. So thanks to everyone involved in that massive Ooh. undertaking. And <laughs> turning it over to Anasu to talk a little bit about what happened in grant making last month. Hi there. Hi. So grant making and sixth floor. Um, we launched last uh, month the first ever Global South survey. It's also the first ever large scale survey we've done at Readers um, in the history of the foundation. Um, we had 47,000 completed responses from 11 countries and 16 languages. We have a teaser for you later today, uh, but the full scale analysis will come soon. Um, we had a very important meeting from the fund Fun dissemination committee, uh, which gave recommendations for 11 Wikimedia organizations around the world um, and funding towards their annual plans. The strong message from the FTC, which is a nine member community team um, from around the Wikimedia world, um, is that large Wikimedia organizations should be showing better impact. Uh, in their recommendations, they reduced the funding by 14% from last year. We did the first ever Wikimania survey oot, um, to make sure that as we think about events uh, worldwide that we run, we are designing them well and effectively. We had a 52% response rate, and 85% said they would do a new project with someone they met at Wikimania. 
Uh, and finally, in terms of partnerships, this is an important one for all of us. Uh, the Wikipedia library has Elsevier joining. Um, it's a small pilot and a big symbol for those of you know, who know and use Elsevier in your editing work. It's one of the largest academic publishers, especially in medical and scientific literature. Thanks to everyone who made this happen. So you may remember that last month we tried something new, which was to actually have a theme for each of these meetings. And the theme for this month is going to be all about readership. And we have a, a series of presentations on just on that topic, which I'm going to pull up now. I'll just click on this guy here. All right, and no. <laughs> You know, Chrome actually does this all the time now, even when it has no problem. It's interesting. All right. Yes. So I wanted to start just talking a little bit about who our readers are before we go and get into the meat of the presentation. And you may have seen some of the comments that always come in from the fundraiser. And of course, uh, now that we have a fundraiser, we get a lot of those coming in right now. Uh, these are some of the themes that we've also seen. And ah, <laughs> This is incredibly frustrating. Let's see. What's... Um, yeah. Uh, these are some of the themes that I'm encountering if I'm looking at um, comments that are coming in from our readers. Uh, like one common theme uh, that I'm, I'm seeing in a lot of these um, reader submissions is that folks are finding Wikipedia to be uh, a tool that breaks isolation, um, that connects them to the, to the world at large, and that helps them discover and understand the world. And this is going to just keep going, isn't it? Yeah, we should get someone to stand here and press Wade. <laughs> OK, so the, the other common theme that we're seeing in a lot of these comments um, is that people really love this idea that they can explore like any topic. And when they go to Wikipedia, they can click around. Um, they can discover um, very, very complex relationships between the subjects that they're exploring. And then, of course, we're seeing uh, comments like this. Slam my arrogant stockbroker brother-in-law when we were arguing over which two countries had the larger GDP. Uh, so <laughs> that's that's also a theme. Uh, readers love to use Wikipedia to win bar bats or to impress their friends. But then every now and then we also hear an extraordinary story from our readers. And one of those I want to show you and to push the limit on technology. We're going to actually try to play a video in a metrics meeting. <laughs> this looks increasingly fun. Continue, accept. Yes, you can have all you want, Google. <laughs>
a teenager who has been using Wikipedia um, to uh, develop cancer prevention and detection methods. And these, these are the kinds of stories that you find once in a while out of like thousands of stories. And when you find them, you really want to tell them and document them. And I think Jack actually also spoke at Wikimania and, and told his story there. Uh, so this is pretty amazing stuff. Um, so, but what do we actually know about our readers um, as a group? Like, what do we know about the whole of Wikipedia's uh, readership? And to the extent that we know things that um, reflect changes in the world around us, what are we going to do about it? So that's the core of this presentation. So what we're going to go through is an update on, on the traffic trends. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, how we can measure the reader experience on an ongoing basis using design research. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing on the product side. And Carol and, and Suya are going to talk about how we reach the next billion users. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Toby for an update on our traffic trends. Thank you, Eric. You can use this in theory. In theory. Awesome. So hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. So I'm going to start out with some numbers. 248 billion articles that were served in the last year from October to October. That's a pretty significant number. It comes out to 34 articles per human on Earth. So obviously, it's a little bit of a vanity metric, right? Not every person is reading 34 articles. Um, but we're reaching people in 235 countries slash regions. I did look this up. This comes from our geolocation software. There are only 206 countries, so there are some regions <laughs> in here too. <laughs> slightly, maybe slightly nervous, but <laughs> read the documentation. So these numbers are amazing, and I think they really speak to the significance of our work in the foundation and, above all, the work of the community. Like, this is awesome, and I'm really excited to be part of it. So hold these. But like Eric said, the world is changing, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the changes in the world um, and some of the changes in which people are using our, our, our reading our content. And you know, these changes are changes, and change is sometimes scary, but there are some amazing opportunities here that I'm, I'm, I'm going to highlight and, and ways for us to, to, to push the mission. I'm going to try to also put these into the general context of the Internet, like what is actually happening, and I'm going to talk really quickly about how another company has dealt with these challenges. So on to the data. So high-level, mobile is growing, desktop traffic is shrinking. Um, our page views are flat globally. It's down about a percent last year. Global North traffic um, is definitely flat, and that's about two-thirds of our traffic. But what's really exciting to me is that Global South traffic is increasing, and that increase is being driven by mobile. Um, in, in the U.S., page views are definitely declining. Um, and what we're seeing is as users transition to mobile, uh, they're not offsetting. The, the increase in mobile is not offsetting the decline that we see on the desktop. And, and I should say, Say that if you have questions about this, I think we're going to push those to the end of the presentation because there's a lot of good stuff uh, following. So globally, it's just another lens on the data. The thing to really look at is like, wow, 64% increase in, in people coming to our mobile site. Like that's something that's really exciting. A uh, quick word on humans and crawlers. I'll touch on this a little bit later, but. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of automated traffic coming to Wikipedia, and this is something I, I, we also need to think about. And uh, for those of you who are more visually attuned, here's, here's the graph. Um, see the desktop site, mobile site. So I think one of the interesting things that we like to do with data is segment it and start slicing and dicing it to get a little bit more insight into what specific groups of people are doing. So we're, we're going to do a little bit of that. 64% um, increase, humans coming to the mobile side in the world. Even in the U.S., 40%, more than 40%. Um, another lens that we like to, to uh, put on the data because it supports our mission is Global North versus Global South. Um, and, you know, here's, here's an amazing number. 
right? Like, like people in the global south are accessing our content through their phones, and it's, it's blowing up, to use an industry term. But the reason that we're not seeing that in the aggregates is because of this number and this number, right? Like it's only a tenth of, of the total um, in the global north. But, you know, obviously you can look at this as, as, as an opportunity. Um, there are a lot more people here than here. Another uh, picture of the global, global north. Just keep the slope of these lines in your mind. Global south, right? Awesome. So we wanted to we sort of, you know, people like league tables and like to see rankings. So um, we pulled out the top growers controlled for page views. And again, what's cool here is, is you know, India, um, huge country, um, part of the top 10 or 12. Um, nice bump this year. Um, also Russia. And then Iran. I think we have to dig into Iran a little bit more. But um, that's, that's pretty amazing, and that's probably a country, I think, that might be opening up a little bit and, and, and is really thirsty for knowledge. So that's really cool. Decliners is, is interesting because it's, it, it's all clustered, or mainly clustered in Latin America. Um, I think we need to dig into this a little bit more. There's nothing that really comes out and, and, and that really is, 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 is striking about this other than the geographies. So, you know, that's the change that's happening, right? We're moving from desktop to mobile, north to south. But we are not alone. And I wanted to talk about a few of the big internet trends over the last maybe five years and try to help you understand where we are in relation to those trends. So I kind of think of, of, of leading trends and following trends and trailing. So I think with mobile and international, we're definitely talk a little bit about, bit about what we're actually doing in order to um, leverage these trends. Um, particularly international, our efforts in Wikipedia Zero are addressing uh, reaching 4 billion uh, unconnected users. Social, yeah, we're really trailing. There's no other way to put it. Um, when I was at Yahoo, fully half of our traffic came via Facebook and Twitter. It's much, much lower here, so it's a big opportunity for us. And then structured data, which isn't exactly like a hot trend. It's sort of been envisioned by the people who created the web as, as where it needed to be. We're actually leading there with, with Wikidata. And, um, Catherine wanted me to mention that uh, Wikidata won the Open Data Publisher Prize from the Open Data Institute recently, <laughs> which is awesome. And you know, one thing to, to check out if you haven't already is Mary Meeker's amazing internet trend reports. They're here. They're just a really good overview of, uh, of what's going on, and I, I, I read them a lot. So finally, um, case study. So. what they've been doing. Yeah, I, I know, but you know, we're sort of in the same we're sort of in the same league. We have similar goals, so work with me. <laughs> so this isn't a great this isn't a great chart. Um, because it doesn't it, it it looks like the mobile DA, the mobile monthly active users and the and the total are pretty much in, in sync. But what's really happening is 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 this line is this segment is growing about 20% a year, and this is growing at about 10% a year. And a lot of the reasons why they're close is because Facebook addressed this pretty aggressively. So here's what Facebook did in the face of seeing their world change. Um, I have been Facebook Zero, which is their version of Wikipedia Zero, was actually not launched in 2010. It was launched in 2012. Sadly, the Wikipedia, wait, what? Oh, they launched in 2010. Okay, sorry about that. 
Right. So they 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 launched their program to 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 reach out to the to the unconnected in 2010. In 2012, they bought Instagram, which was a mobile only photo sharing application. 2013, they re reorganized their entire engineering organization around delivering mobile products and experiences. 2014, they bought WhatsApp, mobile only mobile only messaging company that was popular in Asia. So in summary, our world is changing, and it can be a little scary, but the opportunities, particularly around mobile and international, are amazing, and I'm really excited to, to, to meet those challenges. And uh, you know, we can look to other web properties um, and see people who've met these challenges, and, and I'm confident we can do that too. So because this is uh, the Wikimedia Foundation, quick word around the data. We used the data from the sampled logs along with a new page view definition that we're rolling out. Um, we're going to be looking at the, at the old numbers versus the new numbers to find the discrepancies. Um, we still got to work on uniques. We have the app traffic, but we didn't break it out because it's pretty small. So that's it. Thank you. And uh, next. Uh, Jared and um, Abby. Uh, thanks, Toby. So one thing that the user research um, and UX group has been working on is something that we're calling Reflex. It's remember the name, Reflex. Um, this is something that I wanted to bring uh, that was kind of a best practice at Autodesk, where I was at previously, measuring a qualitative user experience over time in a quantitative way. Our goal is really to create a metric for usability readiness of our products. Initially, I think this is going to be used to inform our process, and I hope eventually it will actually be used um, to guide whether we release things or not. So the reason we're doing this is we make a lot of changes to the site. A lot of times they're very iterative changes. They're small. People don't really think about them um, unless they think about them in aggregate. We want to better understand our users' experience. We want to focus on places where that experience is changing and could be increasing uh, their productivity or decreasing it. And we want to evaluate every change we make and how it affects our users' experience of the site. The way we'll do this is we're going to take a battery of tasks, and we're going to measure those in a qualitative way, but report them in a quantitative way. The things we're going to focus on are the confidence of task completion, which is different than actual task completion, but it's about people, how they see their experience of the site, the ease of use and their enjoyability in doing these tasks. We're going to have these tasks, and then we're going to roll them up to task group levels. I'm going to use a standard metric called net promoter score uh, for doing task groups. A task group could be an example of reading and searching on the site, doing simple edit tasks, doing complex edit tasks. Um, initially, we're going to focus on readership tasks, but we're going to expand this to editing tasks as well. And the last part is a sentiment matrix. This allows users to pick from natural language descriptive words but then we can roll that up to an actual number that we can say this is a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment. The last thing is although Reflex is primarily qualitative, there are a few quantitative measures built in. Success for our fail rate, which is just a binary, time on task, and a click path aggregation, which Abby will show a bit later. So um, to make sure we measure the oh, thanks. Make sure we measure the tasks accurately, no matter what um, what uh, if it's mobile? If it's desktop? If you're using visual? Next. Oh. So um, to to do this measurement, we're going to use um, uh, the possibility of one or one of two tools. We're we're evaluating right now user zoom and loop eleven, um, and we're going to do um, some a pilot to see how these two tools function in our code. And we're going to do a pilot and understand which of these is best to use and how the outcomes look. Um, so then, uh, yeah, we're going to implement a tool in a snapshot, in a snapshot of our, our site. And then we'll move up to like 100 to 500 users per quarter. And this is kind of how it might look in user Zoom. We'll see the, the user will be actually functioning in the site. Their question that they're addressing will be under there. And then they'll say either success or abandoned. But there's also validation within the tool if they actually did su succeed or, or, or not. And this is a click paths aggregation that uh, Jared was talking about, 
we'll be able to see a click path of everyone's uh, movement through our site, and all those click paths will be aggregated. So for example, if uh, a whole bunch of people went one way to accomplish the task, some other people went another way to accomplish the task, we'll be able to see that. We'll all be able to also be able to see when people fall off and aren't able to accomplish the task. Then we can hone in on looking at those experiences in aggregate and going in and deeply and doing analysis on what actually happened so we can see patterns to then be able to make recommendations of how to improve the experience. Um, and this is one of the ways inside both of these tools you can choose which of the tasks were not successful at some certain rate and then we focus in on those tasks. We can sort and search and find those experiences and aggregate, look at those closely. Um, and um, so for reporting and anal analysis, I'll turn it back to Jared. So the, the kind of artifacts that we'll produce from this are obviously the videos that just that um, Abby just showed with the actual screen overlays, the click paths. Um, this will allow the user research group to actually go in, find places where there's problems, and really focus our research on, on talking to users about these areas. We prepared a few kind of prototype artifacts for this. One is a task detail card, and this will allow someone in design or product to quickly look at this and say, for this task, find the average low temperature, temperature in San Francisco in February. They have the reflex number, which is a quick roll-up. We'll, we'll say that you know, we don't ship something without a reflex of X, whatever that ends up being. Time on task, success rate, and then what people think about in the actual group level. This group is about reading, it has a net score of six, and a cinema of seven. We know this thing is not ready to ship, and we can go in and dig in on what we need to address to make it ready. Um, back to the more quantitative things, the success rate, binary, you know, yes, no, we can establish something where we say, if there's a success rate less than 90, we don't ship something. Um, and this will allow us to look at over um, quarter over quarter, year over year, test session over test session, how these numbers are changing. Same with reflex. Reflex is more about the, the quantitative measure, the success, whether people feel about something. We can see how that will change over time as we make changes to the product. Thanks, guys. Clicker. Thanks. So we want to talk a little bit about how we're responding to the, the trends in mobile um, that Toby just um, talked about. And so on the product side, um, we actually have been, we have been thinking about readership now for some time. This is not something that we just started talking about last week. Uh, we've had uh, multiple conversations about what's happening and um, what the priority should be between like growing contributorship on mobile, growing readership on mobile. And the way we think about mobile right now is that we look at the apps as a great playground for ideas. So the native apps, the iOS and the Android apps only have about 1% of our total traffic. Um, so most of our mobile uh, traffic is actually um, by far on the mobile web. 99, more than 99% of our mobile traffic is on the mobile web. Um, but the apps um, give us a lot of capabilities. They're native code. Uh, we can develop very quickly. They're not tied into MediaWiki, our core application. Uh, they're completely independent, so we can try out new things, uh, test it, uh, measure if it works, because apps are um, very cleanly sort of isolated. It's very easy to measure things like session length and unique user behavior. So it's a great, great, great environment for experimenting with completely new ideas, radical readership experiments. Um, and, and seeing if we can increase usage um, on mobile. And then um, some of those ideas may make sense to actually launch then on the mobile web as well. Uh, there will be things that will start on the mobile web uh, for readers, um, but there's um, going to be a lot of stuff that we will pilot first um, within the app land. And Mariana is going to talk a little bit about some of the things we're currently thinking about. Actually, I think Thanks. I have one more slide that I just oh, wanted to show, yeah. sorry. Um, so Bragging go, rights right here. <laughs> yeah, so I, I just wanted to um, highlight one trend that we are starting to see in social media uh, that I think is, is super interesting, um, which is that readers are switching and using um, the mobile site as their primary experience increasingly, and they're commenting on what a great experience it is. If you're a product manager, these wow comments are sort of crack cocaine for you. It's like, wow, the mobile version is great. Wow, wow, wow. This is pretty amazing feedback. Um, and people love the work that we've done on mobile already, and they're actively taking the initiative to switch over. Oh, crack cocaine, that's a strong metaphor. All right. Um, 
So let's talk about what our readers are actually doing on mobile today um, to start this conversation. Uh, so if you take a look at some of these examples, these are actual examples taken from the mobile team's reading history in the Wikipedia app. Um, so these fall into two basic categories, right? We all go to Wikipedia to look up a fact really quickly on the go. Um, we also sometimes go to Wikipedia to learn more about a topic, and you can see examples of each of those. Um, you know, what is norm core? What are these kids doing today? Um, and if you look at the actual quantitative numbers here, they're very interesting, right? So um, on the left, you're seeing the number of times that the average user is opening up uh, the Wikipedia app per month. And on the right, you're seeing the industry average of the number of times the average app user is opening up the average app per month. Um, now, what you can see is that uh, in Toby's um, you know, leading, following, trailing uh, metaphor, uh, we're kind of in the the following to trailing side of things right now um, in terms of our engagement. So the industry average is 13.7 sessions and we're at 4.1. Um, and this of course includes apps like uh, Facebook and gaming apps which are incredibly addictive and are actual crack cocaine for your brain, um, which you will open multiple times a day because you're obsessed with them, right? Um, and, and we're not like that, right? So it's kind of an unfair comparison. But in another way of thinking about it, actually, what's more important for you to do every single day, to learn about the world or to play Farmville, right? Um, we need to do more to actually be the Farmville of knowledge for the world. Um, so <laughs> seriously, right? Uh, so how do we actually do that, right? Um, like we've, we've taken the Wikipedia experience and we've shrunken it down. We're done, right? It's small and handheld. Well, not quite, right? We need to do more. So um, some possible approaches to reader engagement to try to up these numbers um, are the following, right? Um, we, we can do one thing. We can take the quick look up people who are just coming to Wikipedia to learn about a fact and uh, get them to learn a little bit more right on that page, right? We can also give people a reason to come back that's not just, oh, I want to find out what year that movie was made. Um, we can make sharing easier so that people can actually share our content with their friends. Uh, we can give people tools to browse and discover our content, not just have to type in the title of an article in a search bar. Uh, and we can actually make the content nice to look at, which, you know, is kind of good. Um, and the whole point of all of this is we're trying to get Wikipedia to be something a little bit different from it what it is in the minds of readers today, which is, well, I go to Google and I, I look up this fact and it takes me to this thing called Wikipedia and I read about it there, right? That's, that's not what we want. What we want is for people to go to Wikipedia specifically to learn, to be immersed in our content, to get pleasure and joy and knowledge out of it, right? So these are some concrete examples of things that are actually happening on mobile today to try to address some of these feature buckets. Um, and these are, these are all ideas that we're, we're targeting to try uh, and, and see if we can actually move these numbers. Um, so the first thing, pretty simple basic idea, right? You come to a Wikipedia article, let's say it's the Darjeeling Limited, um, and you want to find out what year that movie was released. Um, but while you're there, Perhaps you would also be interested in reading about The Royal Tenenbaums, another movie that Wes Anderson made, uh, or the screenwriter who wrote the screenplay for The, Royal, uh, for the Darjeeling Limited. Um, or maybe you want to find out what the hell a screenwriter actually does. I don't actually know what the screenwriter is. Um, these are just some examples of, of related content that we can show you right on that page so you can go and visit related articles and read a little bit more, learn a little bit more about the topic you're, you're looking at. Um, a reason to return to Wikipedia beyond just searching for stuff that you already know you want to find out about. Um, we know that things happen in the world and those things are reflected on Wikipedia in the form of trending articles. So we see that when uh, an article suddenly gets a lot of edits or suddenly there's a spike in page views, um, usually when somebody dies. Uh, and what we can do is actually start surfacing that information a little bit more actively to people. Um, so we can even use notifications and things like apps to, to alert people to the fact that, hey, like there was this earthquake that happened. Maybe you want to read about that and you're located near that general area. Maybe it's kind of re relevant to you. Um, Another thing that we're particularly bad at, as Toby mentioned, is sharing, right? So you're having an argument with a friend and you're trying to prove a fact to them. What do you do? You send them the entire Wikipedia article? I mean, that's like sending them a giant manual to read through, right? It's not going to work. Um, what you actually want is to be able to pull out a fact and send it to your friend to say, hey, Wikipedia proves you wrong, sucker. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing. So we're actually building a feature to allow you to pull out information from a long, long article and just send it in the form of one little blurb with a reference, obviously, and actual link to Wikipedia. 
Uh, and finally, um, browsing and discovery, right? We've got bajillions of articles. I don't know how many Toby said. Lots. Um, there's lots of articles on Wikipedia. We could try to go through and categorize all of those articles by hand to put them into high-level categories so you can browse them like Pinterest, right? But that would take us approximately 16.7 years. I just made that up. Um, what we could do instead is something that we're talking about is letting readers create those categories for us and for other readers. So you, you have a list of books that you like, right? You start collecting that list on Wikipedia. You share that list with other Wikipedia readers. All of a sudden, you're sharing knowledge. You're letting other people discover the stuff that you like. Um, and boom, problem solved, maybe. Um, ooh, beautiful content is obscuring beautiful content. <laughs> um, well, if you go to the mobile site today, what you'll see a lot of the time is um, a big block of disambiguation text and page issues. Um, and only then maybe do you get um, the lead section of the article that you're looking at. And maybe then you get an image, maybe. Um, what we're trying to do is change that, make the information more visually appealing. So um, in the Wikipedia app, actually, you'll soon start to see an experience that's like this one, uh, where instead of having to wade through a big block of text and info boxes and templates to finally get to your content, the first thing you see is an image and a Wikidata descriptor that tells you what that content is. Uh, so you can actually enjoy reading Wikipedia rather than struggle and fight through the interface to try to find your information. Um, and so how do we actually measure that any of these things that we're doing currently are working? Uh, well, we look at some numbers, the number of people who read Wikipedia, um, the number of times they come back per month, um, and how many articles they're reading every day. And the point of all of this is really to make Wikipedia a part of everybody's daily life, to make knowledge a part of everybody's daily life. Um, you know, as I glibly mentioned earlier, we are the Farmville of knowledge. We should be the Farmville of knowledge. People should be coming to Wikipedia every day to enrich their lives. Um, and that's the challenge that we have on mobile, and it's also the opportunity that we have on mobile. Uh, so yeah, that's it from me. Thank you, Mariana. OK, hello. So um, it was exciting to see Toby's numbers that a lot of our growth is coming from mobile in the global south. Um, what we do know, though, is that billions of people are still not connected, and so they don't yet have access to knowledge. And that's why we do Wikipedia Zero. <clears throat> McKinsey did a study recently about the barriers to connectivity. So um, basically, they have categorized the factors in um, incentives that's basically giving people a reason to come online affordability and low incomes, uh, user capability, and also infrastructure. So this is an interesting report I would recommend. Um, we are focused on three areas that we can address directly, and that would be the cost of data plans, uh, awareness of content, and also providing local language content. So Wikipedia Zero sits it's squarely directed at the affordability barrier to access. We are now up to 41 operator partners across 34 countries. In the last few months, we have launched in Myanmar, in Ukraine, and um, just recently in Morocco. Okay. We know, though, that just waiving the data charges isn't enough to get people using Wikipedia. Um, we have to make people aware of the fact that the resource is available to them and that it's free. And so I wanted to share with you a couple of uh, examples of how our partners' awareness campaigns are actually driving the growth of Wikipedia as a whole, Wikipedia usage. So this is um, from Nepal. We launched with NCEL back in May. They did a lot of um, like big advertising campaign of beautiful billboards about uh, Wiki not just Wikipedia, what it's about, about knowledge, but also that it's free. And they more than doubled the mobile page views in the entire country, not just their page views. We, um, uh, that went up to over 4.5 million, almost 5 million. And that's um, been sustained in the country. And we can see now that mobile usage in Nepal is higher than desktop usage. Similarly, in the Philippines, our partner Smart did a huge campaign for us in June. And they also um, drove total usage in the country, total mobile usage, by almost 50%. Again, that we've been able to sustain that level of usage. What we'd like to see is that um, we see, start seeing more organic growth, not just relying on, 
on advertising campaigns, right? We know that we can't always get partners to do big ad campaigns and we need to find other ways to raise awareness. So the Wikipedia Zero team is working to find other partnerships that would help us drive awareness and we're working with the communications team and the grant making team to refine our messaging so that um, it'll be more compelling to new audiences. So the last focus area for us is local language content. And you know, this is what we do, right? Like you know, so much of uh, WMF activities is in support of our local communities who are writing local language content. But the problem is getting this content to the people who don't even yet know it's there. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why it's hard to reach people in their local language. Um, I wanted to just show you a snapshot of what's going on in India. So we know that there are like more than a dozen major Indic languages that people speak and only about 10% of Indians speak English and those would tend to be the privileged classes, right? So um, when we look at our page views in India though, we're delivering mostly English page views. That indicates to us that we're not yet reaching the people that Wikipedia Zero is trying to help. And it's not just us, the whole mobile industry is aware that in India the people that they're trying to bring online are the people who don't you know, who don't speak English and they're the ones who need content in their local language. And so in that regard, Wikipedia can be a really important part of the solution. Um, we are doing some things on the product side to try to address this, some simple things. Uh, just this week, Adam Basso uh, released some code that would detect the default language on the handset and automatically redirect the user to the right language version of Wikipedia. Cool. Yes, yay. <laughs> Now, okay, so we're starting to see, you know, right away we can see some impact from that, and it's not going to drive uh, page views en masse yet because many handsets, or there aren't many handsets in the market that have regional language defaults. People use their mobile phones in major languages for the most part. But we're, that's, that's a trend. I mean, certainly in India, a lot of the second tier OEMs are um, delivering or are shipping handsets with uh, Indic language defaults. So we think as more people come online, this will become more important for them. And and um, I would just you know encourage everybody to think about ways that we can improve the language UX because this is going to be increasingly important as people come online. So thanks. Thank you, Carolyn. Thanks, Carolyn. So glad to be representing the 1.2 billion Indians. Um, we're all talking about. Um, but as we think about the future, I think it's really important for us to think about who we know of the Global South readers and contributors right now, the 30% that Toby talked about. So we just launched and completed, as I said before, a Global South survey um, of readers and contributors, which is the largest uh, ever survey, survey we've done of the kind. And thanks to everybody who... Um, did the survey. So that's a slightly old slide, but um, forget the text. Most importantly, in terms of what we did, we surveyed in 11 countries and 16 languages, India, of course, being one of them. I think we did eight languages, including English in India. And we had 96,000 responses with a dropout rate of 51%. Uh, and so 47,000 completed responses, kind of, hopefully, statistically significant. At the same time, caveat, 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 this is very preliminary data. We'll be digging into it much more over time and we'll come back to you with um, a much greater sense of analysis soon. We ran the survey on desktop and mobile as well. Um, so in terms of access devices uh, for readers, this is all reader related material right now. Um, obviously multiple responses were possible. Again, as we're talking about there's a strong, strong trend to mobile. Um, smartphone usage is 66%. Interestingly, for our current readers, we're still at a low 5% on feature phones. Um, uh, at the same time, people are still using 55% and 43% laptop and desktop. This is interesting and really important new data. Again, we'll be digging into it much more. Mixed bag of news. In terms of readers, we have a gender gap of about one is to four, right? 20%, 21% identify as female of our readers. Now that is significantly lower than what we think overall on an average worldwide, which is about 50 or more percent of readers are female or identify as female. Um, now the good news is we equally think that we have about one is to 10 contributors being 
identified as female uh, across the world. In the Global South, of the respondents we have, we have one is to four. Now that's, a, again, a significantly interesting data point, and we'll dig into more uh, and understand it better, but that's an opportunity for us. Now here's another opportunity, and it comes out of some of uh, what Carolyn has just said. As Wikimedia projects, Wikipedia and sister projects, we have a tremendous opportunity and advantage, first mover advantage, of content in local languages. And so it's really interesting to look at who's reading what from our respondents. Wikipedia, obviously, but 22% are reading Wiktionary and using Wiktionary, as well as some of our other key sister projects. And that might be something we want to dig into further in terms of entry points, motivations around sister projects. Many of our contributors, for instance, are starting with uh, Wiktionary and Wikisource because it's around issues of language pride and making sure there's content in those languages. Equally, readers are obviously wanting to access that. Um, the last thing I wanted to leave with you is that um, we wanted to check on reach in terms of offline Wikipedia as well. Uh, many different uh, versions of this, distributions, some of you of course know Kivix as the best known. Now there's a mixed bag here as well, no we've never heard of it, uh, uh, and no we've never used it, but we've heard of it, and about 10% who have used it. Um, and this will be interesting for us to think about in terms of reach as we go forward. Is it the Wikipedia Zero model that is the most efficacious versus the offline uh, distribution model? Or, for instance, are we just talking about the current readers who are still relatively privileged as much of our movement worldwide? 75% of them access the internet at home. So our next billion users are not necessarily uh, represented by our current readers and users. Um, so again, really interesting and important uh, data points for us, digging into it more, and we'll come back to you with much more uh, soon. Thanks all, and thanks particularly to Haitham and Asaf for leading this on our team, and everyone across the organization who helped with this. Thank you, Anasir. <laughs> so what, what do I want to want you to take away from, from all of this? Like, what, what are the sort of main themes from all of this? Like, the biggest thing that I think we need to take away from this is that um, if we're thinking about our readers and if we're thinking about a growth of readership, then uh, the next billion readers are going to be in the Global South and they're going to be on mobile. Um, like, there's no question about that. And as Toby pointed out, organizations need to retool themselves and rethink how they do their work. Um, when they meet with challenges like that. So we have to do even more than we already have to get ready in all our products and all our work, not just uh, engineering work, to really sit and think about these two challenges, uh, the Global South and mobile. I wish I could have shown you more, for example, on the product side about um, specific things that we're doing to make sure that our mobile experience works well on the lower end devices um, that are more common in the global south um, or showing you data on like performance and bandwidth considerations that apply um, when you're accessing the internet in, in developing countries. Um, we haven't done as much here as we should. We have done some things like improving image compression, but there's still a lot more um, that we need to do to, and to make sure that we meet like the specific contextual challenges of reaching readers um, in the global south. Um, but at the same time, um, this trend isn't hitting us like as a surprise. Like we have been working in the last couple of years very, very, very much on making sure that we actually can grow with the mobile trend. Um, that is why we are seeing the numbers that, that we're seeing on mobile. That's not random. That's the result of us actually building a pretty awesome mobile experience already. Um, but now we have to double down on that and really respond to the growth opportunities that we have. So with that said, um, in general, we want to make sure that we have room in these meetings for a bit of a larger conversation. So I want to turn it over to you both for questions as well as also comments and observations that we have. And I want to turn also over to others, and the presenters in the senior team to um, respond to questions and comments. Have a for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've got a quick question here. Mic, mic, mic. OK, a uh, quick question uh, regarding what you were just mentioning. Um, in the Global South, I've seen papers showing our page load performance being slower through RIPE and some work that Faden did on the ops team. 
it seems logical to me that a cash pop located closer to our users in the global south would be beneficial. I haven't seen that in any roadmaps for our, our build outs. Do you have any insight into what we might be uh, thinking about for that? Yeah, I know it's absolutely something that we need to um, do more of. Uh, so we have a, a caching center in Europe right now, which actually speaks to some of our sort of historical bias of like serving readers in specific uh, locations with faster access to the site. Um, one thing that we are doing right now is we're building out a, a new data center location in the United States, and a part of this process is actually automating a lot of this to make it really easy uh, when we decide that we want to have a new uh, caching center location or a new DC location to not have this be like a one-year process, but actually have it be like a caching center in a box that you can decide um, to, to set up somewhere. And that's definitely something that we need to, to think about on the infrastructure side. Hi, a question from Aaron um, asking Mariana, but I guess uh, Eric might be able to answer, is um, do we know that people are struggling to find related content and how so, and aren't links like what this is good for? Mariana, do you want to take this one? What did you say I couldn't hear? I said, uh, how and do we know that people are actually struggling to find related content and other stuff? Uh, so yes, um, he, I think Aaron is correct in the sense that blue links currently are the only way that people can find related content. But if you look at any other mobile product that gets people to read things, uh, they don't just rely on a system of links. They rely on surfacing related content in various ways. Um, and I think we, we may not have exact metrics around you know, how difficult is it for people to find related content, but we do see those, those session numbers, and they are quite low. And if we would expect that they would be much higher if people were actually able to uh, serendipitously find and discover things that are in the area of knowledge that they care about. Um, so I think, I think the problem exists, and we know it exists, and we're, we're trying to address it with more. Thank you. Other comments, questions, thoughts? Anything on IC? A oh, question for Anasuya. Can you talk a little bit about how we measure gender gap? Like, is it surveys or like how do surveys even reach people? Or what is the process of collecting gender data? Great question. And one of the things that we've been digging into it for a while. Um, there's at the moment, at this moment in time, this is one of the few surveys I know which actually have this large a sample size in which people have self-identified. In most cases, there have been very sophisticated analysis done, which is projections of what we assume is um, our female contributor or reader rate. Um, and I think Toby can talk more about readership and gender, um, because he has some of the latest data on that. But in this case, this is self-identifying um, in the demographic uh, section of the survey. Uh, do I identify as female or not? OK. Toby, do you want to talk about readership and gender in general? Because I know you have, where is Toby? Right there you are. <laughs> I don't know of the uh, the data that you're you're speaking of. I mean, as far as I know, we actually track very little about our readers, and and as a result, know very little about them. Um, and we do have, like editors self-report, but that's somewhat dicing. So dicing. we've done some some previous readership surveys that for um, the United States didn't show quite as, as strong a split as what we're seeing in the, the global south here with the 76% male for readership. That is new data. Uh, what we're seeing typically in the readership services, I think, closer to 55%. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. It's the comm score numbers. Sorry, Anasuya. Yeah, the comm score numbers show like 45, 55, maybe a little less. Mm -hmm. And it's remarkably, it's remarkably um, consistent across the world. So yeah, we need this kind of. I mean, comm score in and of itself is is is. I'm not sure if it's dubious, but they may use different methods and get different results. So yeah, we need to dig into that. Actually, very little data right now. So, and you're saying 35,000 responses—the largest sample space we've ever had. 
in terms of readers, yes. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other comments, questions before we break? Adam? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about one, one um, set of features we might be able to add. I see that we're talking about usability, uh, and I wanted to add that maybe we should concentrate also on fun. Uh, since we do want to be the farm bill of knowledge, thank you, Mariana, for that. Um, and this would just, that could be as simple as um, the, the idea that's been floated a lot of times of maybe showing recent changes in a different color or something so that you can see that this is a dynamic place where people are actually involved and things are changing. Uh, another idea which would, um, which will probably cause me to be fired is to, to say that we could we could surface commentary about articles so that there could be a mix of original content and um, uh, trying not to say regurgitated content, but <laughs> there I did. Um, Adam, so um, fun, yeah. <laughs> so we might have talked about it in kind of a, a sterile way, but for the reflex, enjoyability um, is actually one of those aspects, and enjoyability goes beyond is it easy, but am I enjoying doing this thing? And if we apply that to tasks like editing or finding related content, I, I think we actually will start getting a measure of our people. Um, is there delight in, their, in our system? Um, and, and we can find something that's easy and successful, but not delightful. And that's actually a place where we can start digging into how do we make our experiences delightful. Yeah, so delight 4.7. Exactly. <laughs> so the one thing I, I want to add on, on the, this idea of like giving readers something more than statistics, for example, about um, article content, like one of the interesting things that you can do with the Wikipedia article is you can break it into its parts. And its parts are things like images and tables and citations. And once you do that, once you start to analyze like the things that make up a Wikipedia article, you can actually uh, create notifications just on recent images that have been added to articles you care about, or recent citations that have been added to articles you, uh, that are relevant to you because of your location. Like there's all kinds of interesting variations on this theme um, that, that you could think about that are less about like things like page views and more about actually content potentially in a very immersive way. So there's definitely lots of stuff that we could do in this category. And we need to wrap up for lunch. That, we are done for today. Thank you so much for coming. One point, one quick announcement for the staff. Um, there is a holiday party on um, for the Wikimedia Foundation on 1217, so please sign up on OfficeWiki if you have not already.